Great. Hi. I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation, of course, and uh, you all for coming. So today I'd like to tell you about a new spectral theory for sure polynomials and their applications. I want to tell you about an application I have in mind that kind of gets me excited about sure polynomials. But I'd also expect that you guys have many other applications in mind that I don't know about. So the second half of the talk, will this new spectral theory I'll present in a concise way that's independent of the context in which I needed it. Okay, so but just before we get started with the specific theory of sure polynomials, let's kind of give you kind of a roadmap for what I have in mind in general here. So let's say lambda is some object. It could be a combinatorial object. It could be an object from a more geometric theory or an analytic theory. Uh, and you want to say that this object has some special enumerative properties. Maybe the counts of these objects, lambda, some generating functions satisfy some beautiful identities or you have some mysterious bijections, and we want to know kind of why, why those things occur, what's special about them. Okay, so one way to kind of get a feel for your objects is not to work with particular objects, but to choose a probability measure on these objects to work by some kind of probabilistic method. And what you'll find is that not only are your objects special, but sometimes there are special measures as well. Okay, so there are certain measures that are really special, namely like you might be able to compute moments exactly some exact formulas. You might be able to determine exact asymptotics. And so why is that happening? Well, a third level of sophistication would be to say that actually, there's actually some special function theory going on here. That all of these objects, a priori we didn't know, but they're actually, those objects lambda index some really special functions. Why are special functions special? They have many nice, function, nice properties from the point of view of function theory. But another approach to this theory of special functions is through representation theory, which is to say that actually the reason those special functions are special is that they're simultaneous eigenfunctions of some large family of commuting operators. Okay? But what's another point of view on this representation theoretic characterization? It's not obvious a priori how to do this if you're just staring at some linear algebra, but you might be able to say that you can see that this simultaneous eigenfunction uh, problem here is given in terms of a quantum integrable system that comes from some underlying classical system. Okay, so in the quantum, quantum physics and well known in pure mathematics, there's this business of dualities where any given quantum system might be the quantization of different classical systems. So it's not obvious how to set this up in general. But once you do have this, then you can rewrite everything from the point of view of this classical theory. So you can start off with some classical mechanical problem or a problem in classical nonlinear PDEs. You can write this thing down. You can ask a lot of non-trivial questions and then ask furthermore about quantization. Okay, so what I'm gonna do today is walk through uh, the first four ingredients in the case of Schur polynomials. So just before we begin, I just wanna show a couple pictures. So, oh, before we show a picture, the most important definition in the talk is given here. This is a general definition. Sorry, the screen is really big. I'm going to step back. So this is uh, the spectral theorem, which is formulated for not necessarily bounded self-adjoint operators. It says that if you have a self-adjoint operator on a Hilbert space, you can find some probability measures mu such that the following identity holds. Okay, for all test functions phi, this matrix elements on the left-hand side uh, can be written on the right-hand side as the moment of uh, mu. Okay? And what is the benefit of this? Well, in, in physics, it's really important. What is this mu? Because if you take a random variable whose law is mu, this has a very famous interpretation. It says that this random variable with law mu is the outcome if you measured the system in the state psi with the observable t. So just to review, what are the ingredients here of a spectral measures? There's two ingredients. We have an operator and a vector psi, okay? And so the one main motivation for introducing this is to be able to work with operators which do not have uh, a full collection of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, 
Okay, and so for example, if you just have look at L2 functions on some domain, then uh, the spectral measure of all the operators of multiplication by coordinates uh, will be given explicitly here, and it determines a random variable Q with this law. Okay? And so that, the thing to highlight here is that what we're doing, which is some kind of interplay between probability theory and representation theory, is not some new idea. This is really just buried in the spectral theorem. Okay, but let's look at a picture of what is this random position distribution of psi explicitly in some examples. So if you have some domain omega, here I have a really nice circular domain, and on below I have some cardioid. Then on the right-hand side, what I've plotted is exactly the density function of these probability measures on these domains. And what have I plotted them for? For a very special size, which are eigenfunctions of the Laplacian in these domains. Okay, so if you were to resonate a drum at certain special frequencies, you would see these pictures. And this whole business of relating the classical and quantum physics is supposed to say that something about these pictures for really, really high frequencies is supposed to remind us of the trajectories of a classical deterministic pool ball in these domains. Okay? And as you can see, this regular billiard up here, this is a, the trajectory of a billiard here is a classical integrable system. The quantization of this thing is also integrable, as given here. All right, so I would, consider, I would urge you to, to kind of keep this in mind uh, going forward, which is what I have in mind when I think about classical and quantum integrability. Okay? And indeed, I just want to kind of emphasize that in the subject of integrable probability, we're in the business of constructing some exactly solvable models, uh, but I would like to address the role of the quantum classical correspondence principle in, uh, in such models. That's kind of a general proposition, but now I'd like to do it specifically. Right? And so back to the outline, when I'm saying that we want to rewrite the theory from the point of view of in classical integrable systems, I'm saying that what makes our enumeration problem special, what makes our probability theory special, what makes our function special, is that there's some integrability going on, which is a concept. Okay, great. So that's, that's kind of my elevator speech. But I'd like to get started uh, with some very particular objects that we've seen a lot so far, which are uh, Young diagrams. Okay, so here in one slide is the anatomy of a partition. So I'm going to draw one here. All right, so I have this two-dimensional corner here. And what I'm looking at are piles of squares. So my square has these dimensions. Uh, if I look at this big pile of boxes in a the corner, then there are certain microscopic quantities we can look at. So namely quantities which really depend on the fact that I have a lot of tiny boxes. So the first quantity is a row. So partitions are usually described in terms of their rows. So highlighted here in yellow is the first row of a Young diagram. Another more complicated uh, quantity, which is also microscopic, is if I pick a box here in the bulk of my partition, I can ask for what's called the hook length. It's a non-negative integer, and it depends on the global geometry of the partition, because it has to go out and find that interface. Okay, so the hook length is another such measure, uh, such quantity. But there are macroscopic quantities, namely things which don't depend on the mesh size, but only depend on the emergent interface. Okay, so this quantity is a profile. The profile, f, is a function. So let's see, here's a really simple profile drawn here. This function, f, which is a, for the partition 1. It's a function of a real variable. Here's c. This is the real line. This is a very simple one, but in general, it's this big uh, piecewise linear one Lipschitz function. And to this macroscopic quantity, I can associate another macroscopic quantity, which is just the slopes of the partition. So here, if I look down, I can look and I can keep track of when I'm going down and when I'm going up. Okay, and you can see this alternates in kind of a crazy way. Right? Uh, and so there's a lot of great enumerative things we can ask about these things. But that's it for the combinatorics right now. Now let's go on and put a distinguished probability measure on these uh, pictures. Well, here's the distinguished probability measure. 
They're called the Poissonized Plancherelle measures. And they're written really explicitly in terms of the hooks. Namely, this rule gives me some random stack of boxes. And what is the law? What's the relative likelihood of seeing this stack of boxes? Well, I choose a formula for it. I choose this product of the inverse square of the hook lengths. But I also have this active parameter epsilon in the law here. So in the law up top, I have an active variable epsilon. And I'm going to draw my pictures with a passive variable epsilon, namely this epsilon, in order to compensate. So the mesh, so the epsilon is passive. And we're going to compare that to which is active in the law of the random partition. OK? And if I have a random such partition in this way, which is defined in microscopic variables, these hook lengths, then just by drawing the picture, I get a random macroscopic object, these profiles. So now I have a model for random profiles. And we'd like to know what is the epsilon goes to zero behavior of these things. So at first glance, you have to think about it. But as epsilon goes to zero in this formula, the typical partition you'll see has more and more and more and more boxes. Okay. So let's state two theorems uh, that are well known for this model as epsilon goes to zero. Okay. To state these theorems, which are emergent limit shape and Gaussian fluctuations, I'm going to need two ingredients. So I also need some colored chalk. So the first ingredient is the unit circle. Okay. Here is the unit circle on the complex plane. Here's a variable w on the circle, complex variable. And the second ingredient I need is a very special function on the circle, which is w plus 1 over w. Okay. And so there's a special function. Uh, consider which, if you did a change of variables, w is equal to e to the ix, then uh, v of x we can write as 2 cosine x. Okay. But in general, I want to consider just a real valued function. And I'm going to tell you what some of these ingredients are in these theorems. So a real valued function takes values in R. Okay. And what I can do is I can plot it in a kind of weird way. Let's see, do this. All right. Here is an interval 0 to 2 pi. And here is my variable x. And my arbitrary function, I'm going to plot in, the op, in, the, in a rotated direction that we normally do. But let's draw one like this. Okay, so here is some kind of function v of x. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this region here. Okay. And then I'm going to do something a little bit crazy, not so crazy, but I'm just going to collect from here to here. Um, I need another color. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the lower, lowest value of v and the highest value, and I'm going to draw. Uh, I'm going to look up top, and I'm going to look at the lengths of all blue intervals, and I'm going to draw like this. Okay, so uh, this function here, this is a plot of a function f that I'm going to call f star of v of c. Okay, and this is an informal definition where I, I look up here, and I look at this length, and I plot it, uh, but rigorously, what this thing is, this is the cumulative distribution function of the push forward of the uniform measure uh, on the circle 
along V. Okay. So it's kind of a mouthful, this definition, but this is the main object of this talk, is that quantity associated to any function V. All right, so now let's state these theorems. I have that ingredient over there. The first theorem, uh, due originally to Carol Vershik, also Logan Shep, is that a random, random profile sampled from this explicit measure here, it's random, but as epsilon goes to zero, it actually concentrates in a limit shape, and that limit shape, which is a profile, the slopes, which are capital F, is exactly that F there, the cumulative distribution function of the push forward of the uniform measure on the circle along V for this very special V. Okay. So it seems a weird way to characterize this object. This is what it is. But moreover, some almost 20 years later, Karov, uh, 1993, first announced a proof of the macroscopic fluctuations of this height function. So namely, we know this, this profile concentrates in a limit shape. What are the macroscopic fluctuations around that limit shape if you were to subtract and rescale? And uh, what he also proved, although not written exactly using these definitions, he proved that um, these fluctuations converge to a random Gaussian field on the support of the limit shape, which can also be described using this same recipe. So this limiting shape was given by the push forward of a uniform measure on the circle along some explicit V. And the fluctuations are also given in the same recipe. You have a very distinguished object called the Gaussian H1 half noise in the circle, and you look at the push forward along V for this special V. Okay, so probabilist, just to review, uh, I'll tell you what now what this Gaussian H1 half noise is. Uh, but first, I'd like to ask if there are any questions about this, this theorem. Okay, great. So let's give four equivalent definitions of Gaussian H1 half noise. Okay. So first, most concrete definition is to define the H1 half noise as a random series. Okay, so this function phi, which is supposed to be this very nice distinguished object on the circle, is just this series here. Uh, the coefficients of this series are uh, independent Gaussian random variables. They are circularly symmetric complex Gaussians, and they have an explicit variance given here. You need to make sense of the convergence of this series. You'll find that it does not converge. Namely, this random field here is not well defined at a point, but you can average it against a test function. So instead of averaging it against a delta function, which you can't do, you can do it for a function which has enough regularity, which is h1 half. Okay? And so here is the definition here. If I observe, if I observe this, this random field along this test function, then what I get is a Gaussian random variable mean zero, and whose variance is given by the h1 half norm of the test function. Okay? I'd just like to mention that is also you can describe this thing as a periodic fractional Brownian motion or the restriction of any Gaussian free field to a very small interval, small loop. Okay, so these are some equivalent characterizations of what this thing is. All right, but what about this model? Right? If I go back to this result, the limit shape is described in terms of two cosine x. The fluctuations are described in terms of two cosine x. But what does the model have to do with two cosine x? Right? These are questions that I like. And so here, actually, there are, before I tell you what one way to see the, this explicit function in this model, let's at least review some reasons to care about this model. And I'm going to give you eight right now. Okay? So here are eight reasons to care that where you might encounter this model of random partitions. Okay. So first of all, I mean, there's a lot of work in random permutations uniformly at random and their relation to the representation theory. And I would really just like to highlight Professor Olshansky's survey in the Oxford Handbook of Random Matrix Theory, which was what really inspired me this whole time. Okay. There's relation direct structural connections to random matrices with this model. We're not talking about analogies. We're talking about an exact identity here, which you may know is uh, called Bordy and Akunkov formula. There's also exact realization of this quantity in terms of uh, two-dimensional conformal field theory, free fermions, not the free boson like the Gaussian free field I just talked about, but free fermions. There's a lot of reasons that are currently still under active investigation in the enumerative geometry and in the high energy physics and the gauge theory, um, but also in the explicit 
uh, discrete probabilistic world, namely Prahufer Spohn, under a non-trivial bijection, you can realize this model somehow in the trajectory of a really explicit model called polynuclear growth model for some very specific initial data. And so what's cool about the point of view number seven, just to highlight, is that the known asymptotic results for this model, if you were to view it from the point of view of this polynuclear growth model, then this carter parisi zhang universality is kind of giving us all the predictions. It says, well, the model is actually just some kind of discrete growing interface, and any growing interface with certain properties, we should expect certain outcomes, okay? But I'd like to propose a different point of view, which is namely that this model and those asymptotic theorems, you can encounter them if you care about the relation between quantum classical physics of this extremely explicit initial value problem, uh, which is, no, I'm calling it the Hopf equation, but it's also known as inviscid Berger's equation, dispersionless KDV, dispersionless Benjamin Ono, et cetera. This is kind of the first uh, nonlinear equation you'll encounter. And if you look at this classical system with initial data given by two cosine theta, two cosine x, then my claim is that you'll encounter this model and those theorems. Okay, so I'm not gonna go over that today. What I'm gonna go over is somehow where are Schur polynomials in all this, right? Like, I didn't write Schur polynomials anywhere so far. And so the goal is to kind of show you now how Schur polynomials can help us understand this result. Okay, so let's indeed, the special functions of interest are gonna be Schur polynomials. Okay. So here, what I'd claim is that this law, which was just at first glance written through the combinatorics of this uh, partition, this random, random partition model here can be also written in terms of Schur polynomials. So this is just a Schur polynomial evaluated on one, zero, 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 zero. So what is a Schur polynomial? Let me give you a definition of a Schur polynomial. There are many ways to define Schur polynomials, implicit and explicit, but here is one that I like. So if you regard a Schur polynomial S lambda, it's a polynomial in infinitely many variables, v1, v2, v3, which is an ordinary polynomial, and it's given by this determinant. So how big is the determinant? Well, the determinant is for any fixed lambda is finite. And it goes from one up until the length of lambda, which is the once this uh, string of rows becomes zero. And it's defined here. There's this, these variables v are gonna be red throughout, but the colors are irrelevant for understanding. And there's also this sneaky parameter, one over epsilon here. Okay, and so for those of you who are experts in the Schur polynomials, you'll recognize that if you make this substitution uh, with this epsilon, then the PKs are what are called power sums. Okay, but we can regard this as the definition of a Schur polynomial. Okay, what's nice about these polynomials in these V variables is that they're orthogonal for some inner product. So that's, that already tells us a lot about the polynomials. So what is the inner product on, um, what is the inner product on this collection of polynomials well, I can just write this explicit operator down, and I can ask that it be the adjoint of multiplication by VK. All right? So this is one way of defining inner product is to, spe is to specify adjoints. But let's make sure we understand how to use this definition, and by computing the uh, norms of the really obvious basis for polynomial ring, which is monomial basis. All right? So here, uh, these V mu's are just some uh, v1, v2 to some powers, and how do I compute this inner product? Well, in the different k variables, they don't talk to each other, the different variables, and so I get a big product over here, and then now I just need to use Leibniz rule, and I look at how many ways can I pair up, that's k factorial, and every time I pair up, I get a factor of epsilon squared k. All right, so uh, that you gotta, you gotta check again. But these are the sure polynomials, and this is a claim. Right, so it's, you know, this is a big definition and what we're gonna do is kind of digest this definition and see some different points of view on Schur polynomials. All right, so let's state those theorems again. But now we can, uh, we can see that we, why do we put one zero zero here? Let's put something else in, okay? And so indeed, I can define a more general object called Schur measure. It's a well-known object in integrable probability 
And we have a complete um, transparent generalization of those older results. So namely, if I take a random partition lambda sampled from the modulus squared of arbitrary Schur polynomial, normalized, then as epsilon goes to zero, that random stack of boxes concentrates on a new limit shape, which is just the push forward of the uniform measure along V. But what is V? V is some arbitrary function. I need some regularity assumptions, of course. But the VK variables inside the Schur polynomial are the Fourier modes of V. Okay? And indeed, uh, Akunkov proved this by different methods, by the method of steepest descent, uh, exploiting the use of vertex operators and the determinantal structure. Uh, but I've given a different proof and also given a proof of the fluctuations. Again, the fluctuations around the limit shape are just the push forward of the H1 half noise in the circle along V. Okay, so these are the, some of the applications I had in mind in terms of the random partitions. Uh, and just a comment for those experts in the room is that here's a picture much like the one I drew over there. I have some kind of complicated V. And I've collected these gold bars down below uh, to define F, which is the cumulative distribution function of this push forward measure. And here's a formula for F. So what is this F at a point C? It's just given by this integral. All right? And so notice that there's a couple things that happen here. We're piling up on the, the range of V, which is a connected interval. Okay, right, so let me, I should highlight the range over here, this range. Oh, I could draw like that. Okay, and we're one cut because V is continuous. So I'm not, the one cut condition is usually a global condition in random matrix theory. This is a local condition because V has some regularity. Okay, and also, because this F is monotonically going up, that means that the limit shape, which is the little f, the profile, is convex. Okay? So that partition over there on this side of the room is not convex. That profile is not convex. Actually, the only pr pr uh, profile of a partition that is not convex is the empty one. And only that is convex is the empty one, right? That's another, another, another strange feature, and I'd really like to highlight that um, for any V, this matches uh, the work of Brewer Dwitz uh, on biorthogonal ensembles, which is probably the cleanest paper ever written. And so here, uh, what's go buried here is that this C, this variable here, is somehow the C, which is on the range over here. So here's C. Here's C. All right, so these two variables are supposed to be the same. OK. So now, uh, if there are any questions about those results, I'd be happy to go back. Oh, yes? So you recall the relation between the large V, uh, the VK, and the function V? Yes. Right, so sorry. So I've said that the VK are the Fourier modes. Right, and the convention I'm using. Ah, yeah, exactly. So it seems like I'm only plugging in the positive ones. But uh, if V is real, real valued, so V is real, real valued if and only if V negative K is just V K bar. So this is, uh, yeah, this is the point. OK, sorry for that. Any other questions? OK, so these kind of limit theorems um, are kind of one application of the theory of Schur polynomials. But it's kind of giving us a hint as to uh, further structures here. But let's go on. All right, so let me start off now with an, a new point of view on Schur polynomials through eigenfunctions, as eigenfunctions. OK, so this is a kind of a dense slide. But at the bottom of the slide is a kind of major result uh, of Karov's, 
which is the heart of his theory of interlacing measures. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a, a more careful analytic uh, theory of what I just discussed rather informally so far. Okay, um, so let's look at the space of probability measures, P, and P-check the space of profiles. I'm gonna define a profile to be a one Lipschitz function that has certain decay condition at infinity. Okay, you'll see why we need this in a bit. And we've seen so far this, this capital F, which, is, which Karov calls Rayleigh function, and we can also use a define Rayleigh measure, which would, such that f is its uh, cumulative distribution function. And just so you know, two measures are considered to be interlacing if their difference is a Rayleigh measure. Uh, and also, it's important to introduce this thing called the shifted Rayleigh function, which is just by minus one. Okay. So Karov introduces this big quantity. It's a huge, very distinguished generating function of a profile. Okay. This is some capital T, this T observable. So T is a function of U. And where does U live? Uh, U lives here. This is a complex plane, and here's U. All right. So uh, here is some big function. And what's, what is Karov's theorem? Karov's theorem says that if you form this, this function T and define it in terms of a profile, Namely, take this exponential of uh, Stiltius transform of the shifted Rayleigh function, then the claim is that it's actually also the Stiltius transform of something else. Okay, so on the right-hand side, we have a multiplicative transform. Left-hand side, we have additive transform. Okay? This is called a transition measure. Okay? And Karov's theorem is that it's a bijection. All right? You'll also see some expressions of this T-observable below but in order to get from here to here, you need to integrate by parts. Integration by parts requires bounded variation, and not everything is bounded variation. In particular, our H1 half noise shouldn't be. Okay? So let's, this big uh, theory of Karov's, this is an organizing principle. It's introduced the language of profiles. This condition up here is, is important for him to be able to say that this is a bijection. And in Karov's paper, uh, which I encourage you to check it out, uh, he gives many, many, many instances of this uh, correspondence. And so the most general incarnation is through the spectral theory of Jacobi operators, which I'll review in the next slide. Okay. So this is a theorem that I'm not quite sure who to attribute it to, but it has to do with this very big literature on the oscillation theory. But let's state a theorem. If L dot, and you'll see why we need the dots in a minute, if L dot is self-adjoint on some Hilbert space H dot, and I have uh, psi naught, some cyclic vector, and I have some scary condition called essential self-adjointness, then I get some, some really big identity. But let's review these ingredients more carefully, okay? Given any operator L dot, if it's self-adjoint, possibly unbounded, we can still define resolvent, which will be bounded operator for any U. Um, we can also define a more complicated quantity called perturbation determinant, which is this left-hand side. Uh, I mix this up. This should be a plus and a, and a dot, or this should be a dot. Can be defined by the right-hand side, which is Fredholm determinant. Okay. So when when we, can we define this? We need this thing to be trace class. Finally, what is a cyclic vector? It's a basic, very very important notion in representation theory. A vector is cyclic if I look at the span of all powers of L dot applied to psi naught. Uh, so let me clarify that. There's a typo here. I meant to say, if I look at all of these guys, then the span should be dense. Okay, so let's make two more definitions. If I look at this one dimensional space spanned by a fixed psi naught, then I can peel off the orthogonal subspace with some projections, and I can define the minor of this operator. Okay. This is a very uh, abstract and dense way of saying, just in some appropriate basis, look at some operator and look at its minor, and these entries are going to be indexed by sign on. Okay. So what's the fact? The fact is that if you under these very special, uh, in this special setup where I have an operator and I have a vector that's cyclic, if I also have this very precious condition of essential self-adjointness, 
then I can conclude that I have this nice identity of matrix elements. Namely, this matrix element of resolvent can be written as perturbation determinant. Okay, so what does it mean to be essentially self-adjoint? It means that the restriction of L to this span has a unique self-adjoint extension. Okay? So why, why are we uh, defining all this? Because actually, Karoff's theory of the markov krein correspondence uh, will occur if we take this identity of matrices and write it in terms of spectral theory. So let's do that. Here's the theorem again up top. Okay, let's recall what is a spectral measure of an operator at a vector. It's given by this identity here. Also, I need one more ingredient, which is a relative notion of spectral measure, which is what is called spectral shift function. So here I could write this ratio of determinants as something explicit. Okay? And so if you can see these two uh, definitions I've just made, we can connect them through this identity up top and derive a corollary. Okay? The corollary is that under this setup, if I do have some operator which has these nice properties, then I can conclude that I have some incarnation of this correspondence, in which case transition measure is spectral measure of this operator at a vector, and the shifted Rayleigh function is spectral shift function. Okay? So, um, right. So this is a very, uh, this is like a, the canvas which I would like to specialize to some particular operator. So far my operator is just L dot. Uh, if you want to read more about this, well you can't, like orthogonal polynomials in the real line has a vast literature, but this buzzword of essential self-adjointness is exactly what you need in order for the hamburger moment problem of tau to be determinate, which is a special case, and that this, this identity is a special case of Nevin Lina's parametrization. Okay, so uh, this is a big, dense uh, collection of analysis here, but what I'd like to do now is specialize this to some explicit operators, such that this identity for some operators will give me that picture, and this identity for some other operators will give me this picture. Are there any questions about, about these definitions? Okay. All right, so next. Here is an explicit matrix, okay? So this matrix here is filled with Vs, which are the Vs that I started the talk with. If I write a function on the circle in a Fourier series, and I put the Fourier coefficients in a matrix constantly along the diagonal, what this forms is called a toplitz operator, okay? So with this notation here, this operator has a boundary, kind of a half boundary. It only goes off to infinity to the right and, be and below, okay? So yeah, so, let's, so as Jeremy said, we have to worry about uh, this conjugacy here, which is an extremely important condition, which makes sure that this Tobolt's operator is self-adjoint. Okay, which, next, the regularity of V, which is the, the, the decay of VK, is of major importance in the applications in the theory of Tobolt's operators. Okay? Uh, finally, let's see. So L of V, written here, is the kind of the most obvious operator you can form from V. It's going to be a multiplication operator. So L of V, how does it act on an L2 function? It just multiplies pointwise, informally, right? This multiplication operator is a self-adjoint operator if V is real valued, and you could ask what is the spectral theory of multiplication by a function V, right? And you should be able to do it explicitly. We're gonna do a slightly more complicated thing, which is if I wrote this multiplication operator, it would go off to infinity in all directions if I wrote it in a basis. But I'm, well, I want to look at these Tobolt's operators, which kind of have this half boundary. Okay, so let's look at inside H, which is L2, I can look at the closure of polynomial ring. So not Laurent polynomials, but ordinary polynomials. And this gives what's called a Hardy space. Projection to Hardy space is called Sago projection. And I have a distinguished vector zero, which I've written here. It's a shorthand notation, but... Uh, Zero is just w to the zero is equal to one, the constant function on the circle, okay? And again, with, with this very special uh, vector, I can peel off the orthogonal complement, and I can form what's called a Toplitz operator, and it's minor, 
Okay? So this big mouthful theorem about having an operator and a vector and looking at the relation between spectrum of an operator and its minors, uh, I, I can now apply those theorems to this, to this special case of Tolpitz operators. Okay? So let's do that. Here's our theorem up top, our old friend of 10 minutes ago. And if I want to specialize this thing, well, I need the operator to be self-adjoint. That you need to check the assumptions. Well, on the right-hand side, we have this perturbation determinant. On the left-hand side, we have matrix element of resolvent. And it's a theorem, a very famous theorem called Sago's first theorem, that this perturbation determinant can be expressed explicitly in terms of V. And it's given by something called the geometric mean, with this very nice formula. Okay? Again, you might not see Sago's theorem stated in this way, uh, but this is equivalent to Sago's theorem. Okay, it's exact computation. I have some function v on the circle. I make some matrices or operators out of that v. Then I ask, I form this ratio of determinants. I should be able to write what that is in terms of v. It's a basic problem. So, and this is the answer, a beautiful answer. Okay. Well, the corollary is that if you plop this explicit formula into this uh, spectral machinery, then the conclusion is that our limit shape is actually appearing here. This is another mystery. So namely, our limit shape is some profile. If we write its t-observable, which according to the Karov-Markov-Krein correspondence would be written in this way and this way, it can be also written on the, as the right-hand side. So the limit shape of the Schur measures, which depended on arbitrary v, can be written, this t-observable limit shape can be written in terms of v by this formula. Okay? The transition measure is as realized as a spectral measure. And also, uh, this limit shape, its shifted Rayleigh function, is a spectral shift function. Okay? So what, what's kind of going on here? Well, uh, Tobus operators and their spectral shifts give us a new incarnation of this f. What I'm not telling you today is a good reason to care about this f, which is that if you look at this initial value problem, this uh, Hopf equation, with real, periodic, nice enough initial data, then this f is a huge conserved density. So what does that mean? This means that if you made a movie of this equation and what would happen, we know that after some time there's formation of shocks, gradient catastrophe, but what's kind of crazy is that if you drew this picture v for some initial, for some initial data v, and you plotted this blue, and you held on to the blue, then the V, as V evolved, the, the blue would not change. Right? So there are infinitely many conservation laws uh, in this equation. So this is a distinguished example of an infinite dimensional classical integrable system. Okay? But again, I'm not going to go too far uh, into the dynamics here. Okay? So let's, uh, how much time do I have left? Five? Okay, great. So with seven minutes, I can do this thing again. Uh, which is, go back to this, where was it? Right here, we had this big analytic setup. And I'm going to put in, I put in a Toplitz operator before, and then I managed to recover the limit shape. What I'm going to do this time is put in a slightly different operator, a Toplitz operator, uh, kind of a block Toplitz operator, and I'm going to recover exactly all the combinatorics of partitions and their, and their profiles through spectral theory. So let's get started on that. OK. Now, before, I had a Toplitz operator whose entries were the Fourier. So here, remember, this was before. And I made some operator, L dot, which was, it had a boundary, right? And I had v0, v0, v1, v1. V2, V negative 1, V negative 1, right? And that was my, well, I should write it, Toplitz operator. I could do the same thing again, and just instead of putting scalar quantities, those Fourier modes, into the matrix, I can put in those operators Vk and V negative k in here. This is kind of bizarre, but I'll just recall that these Vks or multiplication by vk on a polynomial ring, um, 
Well, the same thing by up to a scaling by epsilon, the multiplication by power sums, V negative K is just essentially differentiation by a power sum. Everything's formulated in language of power sums uh, for the symmetric function people in the room. And if I form, if I have these, these two operators act on VK, then I can put them in a matrix. So this is kind of insane, because now I have like a matrix whose entries are operators, but that is a well-known well notion uh, in the theory of Toplitz operators called block Toplitz operators. Okay? Uh, if the blocks are, let's say, R by R matrices for some finite R, that's a bit, uh, it's, it's, this is a bit scarier. My, my entries are operators on a huge infinite dimensional space known as a Fox space. Right? So what I'm forming is a Fock block Toplitz operator. It doesn't really roll off the tongue. But we're going to see a reason to care about this operator, and it's minor. So if I look at the minor here. Right. So again, if each entry acts on Fox space, then this huge operator L is an operator on the tensor product of the Fox space and the Hardy space. Okay? This is just basic multilinear algebra here. So what's next is that I can specialize the karab markov krein theory with these operators. So here it is. So uh, here's our theorem that we love up top. It's a really special condition. And before, I highlighted this ratio of determinants, and I said that Sago really knew about this. Yes? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Right, it looks the same, right? And so here, let's, you can ask that same question for classical Toplitz operators, right? Well, if I just look here at the minor, look, it looks the same, right? But this, so this, this seemed to be L plus, right? But there's the most special ambiguity, which bothered me for some time when I was trying to check the details of everything here is that if I define L plus to be pi plus L dot pi plus, I, can reg I, I might want to regard as an operator on H dot, not H plus. So I have this, and I have a bunch of zeros. For the record, this is why I introduced what is called shifted Rayleigh function instead of ordinary Rayleigh function. Are there any other questions about these definitions? <coughs> okay. Right, and so the punchline is what? That, well, before I looked at this ratio of determinants, uh, for classical Toplitz operators, and one can spot this famous first Sago theorem. On the other hand, if you look at the left-hand side, for these large Fock block Toplitz operators, uh, Nazarov Skliana in 2013 noticed that the top left entry of, that, of the resolvent of that operator parameterizes a very natural family of commuting operators. So let me just say that up there, you'll see this object. This is a collection of operators on a Fox space. H naught itself is a Fox space. And the statement is that these are some kind of uh, quantum transfer operators for the quantization of this uh, inviscid Burgers equation. So. OK. So again, remember, I, I, I was saying that special functions, what makes them special, is that they solve a simultaneous eigenvalue problem. So not just for one operator, but for a ton of operators. And in the theory of like quantum inverse scattering and so on, we want to package all that up into a spectral parameter. So this u um, is what is called what we, we should call a spectral parameter. Namely, these operators all commute and they're, they're the modes of these operators in the expansion spectral parameter 
uh, are going to be a bunch of self-adjoint operators that are diagonalized on sure polynomials. And the eigenvalues are given by this t observable here. So what is the eigenvalues of these operators t? It's given explicitly here only in terms of macroscopic observable, the profile. Okay, and indeed, you recover the, spec the transition measures uh, that we know from uh, Professor Beyond's theory, and also Karov's, as a spectral measure, but you also get to say that this macroscopic observable, the profile, you can speak about this thing in the language of like classical analysis and perturbation theory, which is Krein's spectral shift function. So that's the conclusion, is that this interlacing sequence of extrema are actually the eigenvalues of some finite dimensional matrices somewhere, right? And this is this new spectral theory. Um, and so recent similar constructions are, are, have also come up, uh, but I won't spend any, let me leave this up. And so I'm, I'm very excited about this, and uh, what I haven't told you today is kind of a first principles derivation of all this from the point of view of classical physics. But thank you.